My name is Dan Stook. Um, I'm an assistant head teacher at Stretford High School, um, a school which is only a couple of miles from here. Um, I've been teaching eight years. I'm a, a maths teacher by trade, but split my time between maths and IT at the moment. Um, hopefully, what I'm going to try and I've, I've changed this presentation about five times since I arrived here yesterday. So hopefully, what I'm going to try and do is is talk you through some of the the challenges and, and some of the exciting things that are happening in secondary and to a smaller extent primary schools across the UK at the moment and um, hopefully draw on quite a lot of parallels between what's happening in our sector and, and the further and higher education sector as well because I've been listening to an awful lot of stuff over the last two days and, and marvelling at how we seem to be facing a lot of the same challenges. So um, Stretford High School is a bog standard comprehensive the independent kindly called us on results day when they put that lovely picture of our star students opening their results in the paper um, they were quite kind about us after that so I'll, I'll let them off but we are a traditional comprehensive school i think i'd probably call us um situated just between old trafford football and cricket size of, of, of play so literally about a mile and a half away probably as the crow flies so it's a, a very inner city Manchester School. Um, it is in Trafford, which means we're in a selective education system. So we we lose the, the cream of the crop off to grammar schools before they get to us. Um, we have 750 fabulous students who, who do really well. Um, what I thought I'd talk to you today about is how technology is being used to support learning in secondary schools at the moment and some of the challenges financially and otherwise that, that we're facing at the moment and, and hopefully all of this is driven by the teaching and learning um, and in each of these little sections I'm going to try and just cover a bit of the reality of what's going on in schools at the moment. Um, the reality is there's some fabulous teaching and learning going on in secondary schools at the moment. Not all of that is as well supported by technology as it could be. There are also schools and, and teachers who are using technology in ways that I could never have Im imagined myself. Um, we, a lot of our technology education or education supported by technology still takes place in rooms a bit like that. That was one of the IT classrooms at my school when I joined there about three years ago. Um, when I joined, we had, there's a little bit of painting the picture at Stratford High School, we had about four or five rooms like that. We had a series of laptop trolleys around the place with, in, in various states of, uh, of repair. We had a a lot of our services came through the um, local authority and were a little bit unreliable um, and taking your class off to use one of those rooms by the time you'd got there you'd lost a quarter of your lesson anyways um, and it wasn't always conducive to to what we were looking to really produce um, a lot of our teachers and i'm being honest here even some of my teachers i'm not going to paint stratford high school as 100 percent an amazing place where technology takes over the world uh, a lot of our staff and our students across the country still think that using technology support learning basically involves wikipedia and press and copy and paste uh, particularly the students i have to admit um, and one of the things that's really one of the our big hurdles i suppose in in terms of getting the teaching and learning where we'd like it to be across the whole of the secondary sector are still the dreaded performance league tables and our English and math scores, as you will all be acutely aware of the press for the last few weeks. Um, they are, in my humble opinion, the biggest stifler of innovation and creativity and everything we'd like to happen because the pressure that especially head teachers and governing bodies are under for, for the performance in those subjects make it very easy to focus all our energies there and, and, and drive out some of the stuff we're really wanting to see happening and there is fabulous stuff happening in classrooms um just quickly whizzing around there some those five words at the bottom those four words in particular creativity independence drive and respect that's that's kind of our core values and what we try and instill in our pupils and, and that's that's what we really believe in at stretford high school and that's what hopefully we're starting to see in all of our classrooms and in, in my opinion all of that can be supported with the use of technology there's there's schools across the country looking at trying to release students and let them take charge of their learning and I think some of the work Dan Pink has done and, and Google on their 20% time of idea of, of giving time over to students to 
go off and learn stuff on their own of their own volition is something we've been working hard to build in and in secondary schools that's particularly different difficult to factor into a timetable um we've seen some great work starting to take place with i think sugata mutra was here last year or the year before uh, probably standing where i was talking about his self-organized learning environments and, and that's something we've been pushing at our school and is is, is starting to take off across the country as people are realizing that students can lead their own learning and can go off onto the internet work in teams and, and, and deliver like learning themselves and it's a bit scary for teachers to take a step back and leave them to it but once you do that it's it's getting quite exciting there's some fabulous work going on in schools and this isn't so much in my school i'd admit using games based learning is really taking off in little pockets that little picture there is a little primary school class who are all in Minecraft, um, if you've ever come across that, and are, are, are building structures and collaborating away. And that's that's the world that our students live in when they leave. And we're just starting to try and pull that into the classroom and make the most of it. Um, and obviously, we're incredibly focused on literacies all across the board, whether that's traditional literacy, which is, is still a, a big driver. Um, all the digital literacies, et cetera, et cetera, that we've, we've, you guys have been talking about, I know, um, across this conference. And I was sat in the, the disc session yesterday on digital literacies thinking, we're doing that too. Um, just out of interest, because I hope we'll get the, gauge the audience right. Can, hands up if anyone does. I can't resist a hands up because I'm a teacher, does work in schools. Excellent. A couple. What about teacher training? I suppose might be a link here. Higher education. Good, I've got the audience right, that's all right then, thank goodness. Um, as far as the kind of the, the provision, what we're, what we're, the systems, et cetera, that we're putting in place, we've, the reality is those two happy chappies, and I'm not going to get too political, have, have, have cut the amount of money we've got to spend in schools, whether they dress it up one way or another, and we're an inner city school who gets an awful lot of people premium money. That still doesn't balance out what has been taken away by other hands. So if we give with one and take away with the other. Um, that there is less money for us to spend on on our infrastructure uh, and and the back end there. The the local authorities obviously used to have a key role in this, and as more and more schools move to academy status, etc., those local authorities um, are losing their business in a way from us and hence the systems that they had there to help back us up the technical support etc cetera, etc cetera, is starting to disappear and in fact at, at our school we've almost entirely moved all our stuff away from the local authority we used to have a 20 meg internet connection from them which whenever i tested it was more like four and worked one day hour two and that was great and when the harnessing technology grant disappeared from local authorities the that used to cost us £4,000 and we got a bill for about £12,000. Um, so the reality is that wasn't good value for money and that's something that we're really having to look at now and go out into the private sector and see that those services we used to get from the local authorities, um, where can we get them from now? Just back in that last one, I'd put RM as an example there. There are still, and I'm lucky, I feel, not to be in this situation. A lot of schools who have managed service contracts which have their own benefits allegedly cost wise but real problems when you want something to get done in a classroom the projector's broken right when well, you make a phone call and somebody will come and fix it by the end of the week that that doesn't work um in a classroom environment you need somebody there on site who can fix it immediately so we've been really looking to budget properly ourselves i'll be honest we used to have pots of surplus cash left over at the end of the year and if there was a pot of surplus cash in my school I was really lucky because the head teacher would say do you want to spend that on some new IT equipment Dan and I'm not going to turn down that offer so of course I would um, but and, and I think that happened across quite a lot of the sector um, that's great until it gets to the end of its life three years later and there isn't another pot of cash there to replace it so I think one thing schools have been trying really hard to do is look at the total cost of ownership of devices look at the lifespans look to see if we can replace those at the end of it and look to build sustainable models do we need to buy everything capital wise or lease it um we've been built trying to build relationships with the private sector i've developed really good links with toshiba um with the mcc and with companies who actually kind of care about what's happening in the classroom and how their stuff's being used and they've given us an awful lot of extra value over just what we've bought from them 
Schools are also looking at models like the eLearning Foundation, which is a fabulous charity. There's lots of schools going down the road of looking at one-to-one -one devices, whether that's an iPad or a netbook or, or whatever device it is. And, and the eLearning Foundation is a charity that helps schools um, get parents to contribute part of that cost to that. And, and it's amazing what you can actually set up with those. I'll mention that a little bit more in a minute. Um, as far as where we kind of get our vision and our intelligence about technology and where it's going and, as, and training our staff again, those old systems and, and support networks we had in place are, are dissolving quite rapidly back to God rest their soul. We're a, a great government organisation that really did provide advice at a, a senior level to schools of, of where technology could be used and where it will be used in the future and, and that's sadly gone with, with nothing frankly to replace it. Um, and again, like I mentioned before, the likes of the local authorities aren't supporting us with that um, knowledge for us as well as the training that we used to get and unfortunately again the money comes into it we, we used to be able to send people off on lots of training courses how much value we got from those I don't know but that, that happens less and less now so we're pushing out I think where, where a lot of people are and looking at building those networks I found that talk from Microsoft yesterday really interesting because that's the sort of thing we're having to tap into now um, and this isn't all staff, all teachers, and this is one of our real challenges at the moment. Te there are lots of teachers going on Twitter, um, building social networks, building communities of interest, um, following blogs of prominent people who are talking about what's happening in their schools, but there's no centralisation of that anymore. Um, and the actual percentage of teachers who are getting their own CPD and, and getting ideas and such like that from social networks and, and from those looser structures is, is still pretty low so that's one of our big challenges I think is pushing out from the core of us who use this and take this for granted now to, to really get more and more staff involved with it. Um, teach meets are a fabulous little invention that's sprung up through social media and such like over the last few years where teachers go and spend an afternoon or an evening get on stage three minutes here's something fab I did in a classroom and off they get three minutes somebody else here's something fab I did in the classroom and off they go and it's a, a, just a great form of professional development and again that's something where keen staff are doing that and we're now trying to take those models and put them back into school it's a far more effective model of training than what I'm doing now of standing up and, and talking to you for 20 odd minutes on a topic ironically um, there's other communities there from a from a techie point of view edugeek is one of the most amazing websites we don't have any support when, when my IT team get something they can't solve somebody on there can because there's IT tech support guys from all across the education sector on there and we'd be lost without that now um, ooh, there we go a big part of one little bit I wanted to just hone in on is something I've been involved in the last year or two um, getting the students to help with that training in school help with training their teachers and help with training their peers as well um, the reality is I don't like the digital migrants, digital natives kind of thing that has been bandied around for years, but there's, there's elements of truth to that. Um, a lot of my teachers are definitely digital migrants um, and they pick things up and they try their, their very best, but the more support they can have in the classroom when something goes wrong, the better. Um, that's me at the top, buried under paperwork. Um, this little idea of digital leaders came to me and I from a colleague called Christian Still. It's a dead simple. It's basically to develop a group of students like digital prefects, those students who really are the digital natives who have got those literacies and have got the confidence to sit in a classroom and go, do you know what, Miss, do you want a hand with that? Or to deliver training with me, which they'll be doing this afternoon when I knit back to school, or just to help out their, their uh, fellow peers in the classroom. So We've been really pushing this over the last couple of years and it's something that's kind of spread out quite virally. Again, this was supported by in the early stages by Toshiba and I have to give them a lot of credit for helping us get out there, helping us go to other conferences and spread the idea. And there's now 50 to 100 schools across the UK who have taken this idea and run with it. There's an unofficial kind of digital leader network um, website which some new teachers have kind of taken the ball on from us a couple of us that started it and have really run with it and it's a great example of those social networks pushing ideas that work all across the school um, the little picture in the bottom right there that's two of my 
year 11s who've just left um, speaking at the um, European Schools Network conference in Copenhagen earlier in the year. So they've got, as well as helping me do my job in the school, which is what I originally liked the idea for, because I need about five heads. They've got great things out of it as well. Right, five minutes. Technologies, the technologies in our school is, in reality, is a mess. There's so many, you walk from one school to the next, what's, what's, what's being used there is a complete hodgepodge from one place to the next. There's interactive whiteboards galore, most of which get used to project onto. Um, there's an awful lot of kit that schools have bought over many years because it was fashionable um, and that continues and will forever continue. There's kids bringing their own devices in, really powerful ones, and no mobile devices allowed in these classroom signs on the door, which is a little ironic. There's learning platforms, the likes of Fronter or Moodle or Blackboard, etc., which, frankly, when you're a 13-year-old, don't really compete with Facebook and Tumblr and Xbox Live. So, and they're really expensive, a lot of them. Um, there's the dreaded the dreaded web filter controlled by somebody in an ivory tower somewhere, which means for in many, many schools still, teachers will go sit at home, plan a wonderful lesson late at night with involving lots of fantastic websites. They'll get into the classroom the next day, they'll take them off to the computer lab and everything's blocked and the whole lesson falls apart and fair enough, they decide, I'm not doing that again, I'll get the sugar paper and the pens out next time because I know that works and I know where they are. Um, so one thing that is absolutely crucial in my eyes, and we're, we're starting to get there, and I've fought for it for two or three years in my place, is to get outstanding web access across schools. And, and I've just about done that now. That sadly aren't my speeds. That was the speeds of the network sat outside here. But we've got a 100 meg line of our own at school, and I control the filter. Um, and it's not really filtered other than for the obvious things. Um, we've just thrown in a, a, a cheap wireless network at our place that we found through EduGeek, £7,000 and we've flooded the whole place in a network that handles what we want to do. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Um, but that's absolutely crucial because you've got to give teachers the ability to kind of do, be able to innovate and that's really tricky. Um, Abdul's at the bottom there from Easter Academy. Um, I found a little quote from Abdul as I was on the bus this morning. He works at a school where they gave every child an iPod Touch. Um, and they've got all the staff there have iPads. Um, he said that technology must not be a barrier to learning. If the technology doesn't work for staff and students, it won't work to enhance learning. I think that's key and that's something we've been trying to do at our school. Um, bring your own device works, but it's not a solution. We, we allow the students to bring them, I'm gonna skip over that one, bring their devices into our school, but I don't think it replaces the infrastructure that we need to take with us. Um, we love Google Apps, it's great. And we love free tools in our school. Um, there's stuff like that out there that does as good, if not a better job than a lot of the VLEs. I skipped over Edmodo there, which is like a little Facebook for schools. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, a few things, a couple of projects we're working on, just to be a bit selfish and talk about our school. We're looking at, our teachers have all just been given an iPad um, and we're looking at, we're, I know somebody mentioned yesterday why we're still doing trials. We're, we're, we're effectively doing a trial this year with a couple of classes as well. Um, we're working with the eLearning Foundation because I've, I've spent a year going through the sums and even in our inner city school, we can afford in the money that we've always used to spend to equip every single one of our learners with an iPad-esque device, whether that, whichever one we choose eventually, with some very minimal parental contributions and they get to own that at the end. And in a school like ours, getting that technology into the homes as well is key because they're only with us for 20% of the time. So that's something we're really working hard on. Um, the Carphone Warehouse a pilot help working with this little pilot that I hope to get involved in and using um, iPads to, to promote some math. So again, it's finding those um, partners who are out there who, who are willing to get involved in the actual teaching and learning of what's going on. Um, Show the student how their heart works. Oh. I'm enthralled if you... This is Janice. Janice is a teaching assistant who's had an iPad for a week and a half. And I said, Janice, could you just... I know she's amazing. Do me a video of what's been going on. Do I love my iPad? Well, what do you think? 
I've used a dictionary today, a translator, an interactive website for showing digestion. I've shown a student how their heart works. I've enthralled a few students by showing them an art circles iPad app. I've learned a piece of music and recorded it on uh, my garage band. I've used the calculator. I've used the iPad to show a pyroclastic flow on an iPad on um, a volcano, and I've investigated the world of insects. Do I love my iPad? Well, what do you think? I have not done any training with her yet. It's the first week back, but I've given her the tools and the network that are that easy to use. That the learning just takes place, and hopefully, we've started to build those networks in school so that the students are helping the staff and the staff are helping the students and that's been really key to what's been going on i've skipped over the digital literacies bit there but all that work that is going on in universities we're doing exactly the same rewriting our ict curriculum and, and trying to get those skills in there i think that takes us back to the beginning and i've got the red card so i'm going to stop there <laughs>